My name is John Passfield, and the title of this reading would be The Poetic Novel 2, Part 2, Video 12, Hemingway Part 2. So it's the second Hemingway essay in that book, The Poetic Novel Part 2. So here is the book, The Poetic Novel Part 2, Influences and Elements, Three Yellow Roses, A Rose is a Rose is a Rose, said Gertrude Stein, by John Passfield. So the book is all about imagery as was that quote, a rose is a rose is a rose. So, this is a copy of a manuscript, but there is a copy on my website, johnpassfield.ca, which is available to read for free. All you do is click on the cover icon, and the book will be yours. The subtitle is Influences and Elements, as the essays in the book are about the writers who have influenced me and the elements that I've developed in my pursuit of a form for the poetic novel of our time. Well, speaking of the poetic novel, here are my first two novels. I'll hold them up now and refer to them very briefly later. This is Grave Song. This is the first novel I wrote, The Agony of Robert Chisholm, a novel by John Passfield. That's the old Anglican Church, 1824, in my hometown, St. Thomas, Ontario, Canada. My second novel I will also hold up and refer to just briefly later, Jumbo, P.T. Barnum's Greatest Creation, a novel by John Passfield. The circus elephant Jumbo died in my hometown by an accident in 1885, and I wrote a novel about that. So both those I'll refer to briefly, but it'll save me uh, fumbling around trying to find them when I'm mentioning them. Hemingway, the topic of this essay, is one of the most intriguing authors, both in his person and his writings, that I have studied as I have taught and written literature over the years. So it's not surprising to me that I've written two Hemingway essays for this series of books. I will read three of 11 segments of the second Hemingway essay in this video presentation. So here's a quotation from a Hemingway novel. The motorboat came gallantly up beside the piling of the dock. Every move she makes, the colonel thought, I'm going to refer to that phrase, the colonel thought, as a triumph of the gallantry of the aging machine. We do not have war horses now like old Traveler or Marbo's Lisette, who fought personally at I.O. We have the gallantry of worn-out rods that refuse to break, the cylinder head that does not blow, though it has every right to, and the rest of it. So I'm going to refer to the rest of it as well. So two phrases there I'm going to refer to. The colonel thought and and the rest of it. Okay? I have an odd sensation. This is me talking now. I have an odd sensation when I read the creative works of authors such as Hemingway and Virginia Woolf, whom I studied from my 20s to my 50s as I was preparing, as I realized in retrospect, to start my writing career, which I don't have when I read their critical works. I've always realized that I have my own interpretation of their critical works, so I'm quite comfortable writing about those critical works at a distance in time from when I first read them. I simply give my impression of what those writers' critical comments mean to me. However, when I read their creative works, which I haven't been doing since I've been so busy writing creative works of my own, I realize now what I did not realize at the time that I was studying their works. And that is that I write very differently than they do. This is a passage from Across the River and Into the Trees, which is quoted by Carlos Baker, Hemingway's biographer. The first thing that I think of when I read such a passage is that the colonel thought is a clinker in terms of the way I write my novels. My second thought is, and the rest of it, and the rest of it, the phrase from that passage, is Hemingway the writer almost trying to duck out of what he has just done. What Hemingway has just done, and is wondering whether he should have done, is to tell the reader what Colonel Cantwell is thinking. So if I were to make a distinction between my creative writing and the creative writing of Hemingway, at least based on this section, of a novel at this stage in his writing career, I would say two things. One, that Hemingway tells us what the main character is thinking. Well, number two, John Passfield, me, does not tell us what the main character is thinking, but rather he gives us the imagery by which the main character might be thinking. So if I were to write this passage, there would be two images in the mind of Colonel Cantwell 
which would be placed side by side with a blank space between them. Number one, that the colonel realizes that he's getting old. And number two, that he realizes he is riding on an aging machine with worn out rods, but which is still able to function. Just those two images side by side with a blank space between them on the page. And that would be that. So the question in the mind of the reader and the author would be, if I had written the passage, does the main character make a connection between his own situation and that of the machine? Now it's possible that there are three answers to that question, but the answer would, be, would not be on the page, it would be in the mind of the reader. One, that the main character is consciously aware of the connection. Okay, maybe. Or two, that the main character is not consciously aware of the connection, but is subconsciously aware of the connection. Or three, that the main character is neither consciously nor subconsciously aware of the connection. All would be possible in my novel. Only number one is possible in Hemingway's novel because he said so. In any case, the author and the reader and the character will never collaborate as to the answer to the question in my novels, the question being, what is the main character thinking? <coughs> Excuse me. This is how Hemingway wrote this passage. This is how I write the passages in my novels and novellas. We're two entirely different kinds of writers, although I've studied Hemingway for hours and don't regret it. I learned so much from Hemingway, but that's one of the things I differ from in my writing from Hemingway. There was a time in my 30s and 40s and even up to the point where I became a writer in my 50s where I had read the Hemingway novels so often I resorted to reading them all at once by interlaying chapters from the various Hemingway novels. What I enjoyed, what I wanted to observe was the Hemingway sense of the immediacy of action and place, of the illumination of everyday events Till I'd written a number of novels, I doubt whether I was even aware of the question of what is the main character thinking, or of the technique of placing imagery side by side with no authorial comment. Perhaps I should say that I was doing it intuitively. I assume that my two earlier novels, which I held up, Gravesong and Jumbo, will show this technique, but I was certainly not theorizing along these lines when I was reading Hemingway's novels and short stories so intensely. 20 years before I became a writer. Okay, so here's the second segment of this essay which I'm going to read. A quote from Carlos Baker, Hemingway's biographer. If you had wished to follow the mythological method of Elliot the Wasteland or Joyce's Ulysses, Hemingway could obviously have done so. But his own aesthetic opinions carried him away from the literary kind of myth adaptation and over into that deeper area of psycholo excuse me, psychological symbol building, which does not require special literary equipment to be interpreted. Well, the one clinker in there maybe is um, deeper, like is Hemingway deeper than Eliot and Joyce, but nevertheless, he's different. I agree with that. Carlos Baker seems to find it necessary to distinguish between the two as if no one writer could follow both mythological methods, but I don't think that need be the case. It is true that the works of Joyce and Eliot are laced with historical and literary references, while Hemingway's work is built on what one would call natural symbolism. But I don't see why a writer would feel it necessary to work with one and not the other. I find it possible in my novels and novellas to work with both. I was fascinated by the sense that writers such as Eliot presented, presented colon, that all of the historical mythological elements were available to the readers of our time, which when I started to read was the middle of the 20th century. So we know all these references. Why not use them? Why wouldn't a character think of them if the character knows them? I spent a lifetime reading in that vast body of literature, which gives so many image patterns that are so close to our own daily, monthly, yearly, decade-long and lifetime experiences, and I've worked many of these references into my novels whenever they seemed appropriate to the topic that I was working on, whenever the main character would have thought of them as a natural thing. However, I was greatly struck by Hemingway's ability to see, rather to evoke for the reader, the natural mythological patterns that surround us as one lives one's daily life, as do Nick Adams, Frederick Henry, and Santiago. So I find it quite logical, technically, to interlayer imagery from both 
mythological sources of thought, the natural and the historical literary, in the minds of my main characters. It's important to me that my main characters have a number of layers of thought, some of which draw on the elements of the world of the mythological literature of the past, and some of which are derived from the present moment in which each is living, as two thought-patterning elements among those which offer themselves as potential meaning to the sensitive mind. When reading Hemingway, when reading about Nick Adams and Frederick Henry and Santiago, I suppose one wonders just how aware each character is of the potential imagery there is in the experience to which each character is living. That's why I bridle at such a passage as that from across the river and into the trees, even though it seems logical to Hemingway to tell the reader that Colonel Cantwell is a well that the old boat that he's been riding in offers potential imagery, which can and does illuminate his life, I don't feel it logical to do so in my novels. The reason is that even with people who are close to me, I feel that there's so much more going on in their minds that I could ever be aware of. It strikes me that all imagery is potential imagery for both the thinker and for the observer. So it makes no sense to me as a writer to point out to a reader which potential images are pertinent for a main character and which potential images are not pertinent, which potential images are active for a main character and which potential images are latent. And I feel that doing so for a reader gives a false sense of how we interact with actual people. The whole point that I'm making is that literature should, as far as possible, reflect the lives that we humans live here on the earth. And so it strikes me that any attempt to suggest that we have more control over or understanding of our situation here on earth than we actually have is something that I avoid when writing my novels. I've learned probably just as many lessons from Hemingway as I have from T.S. Eliot and just as many lessons from Eliot as I have from Hemingway that all of experience, number one, the experience of past peoples as expressed in the imagery they left behind, which is the purview of Eliot, and number two, all fresh experience, what is happening to us not only on this particular day, but at this particular moment, which is the purview of Hemingway, offers potential imagery. This strikes me as a preferable way to mythologize my novels, to use both methods of image presentation. Okay, here's a third segment, starting with a quote by Carlos Baker, and then moving into my comments. On Thanksgiving Day 1927, Hemingway told Perkins that he completed 17 chapters of the Tom Jones work and was only a third through, so a new novel similar to Tom Jones, picaresque, I guess. He had decided to change the narrative method to the third person, having tired of the limitations imposed by the first person narrative. So first person narrative limitations. But a farewell to arms like the sun also rises used the first person method. Hemingway did not begin to employ the third person consistently till the middle 1930s. So first person or third person, limitations, freedom from limitations. Here's a topic which is perhaps of concern only to me, as I've never seen books or even essays devoted to the topic. I've seen the odd reference to the choice of first person or third person narrative. Usually it's in a biography, that of Dostoevsky, of Henry James, and here in Carlos Baker's critical biography of Hemingway. Most of the commentators simply say the author chose one or the other, considered or tried using one method, and then chose the other method and wrote the novel. They never talk about why or what the advantages or disadvantages are of first person versus third person. Strikes me that Dostoevsky started to write Crime and Punishment as a first person novel, felt the limitations of that technique, and then turned to the third person form of writing and completed that novel. I don't recall which novel Henry James started to write in the first person, but perhaps I'll try to find out and put a footnote in this essay. Here we have Hemingway starting a Tom Jones-like novel in the first person, getting a third of the way through, changing the narrative method to the third person due to limitations, and abandoning that novel in order to write a farewell to arms in the first person. So all this is fact, but nobody seems to want to discuss why, what the uh, implications are. 
At this point in my own writing career, it strikes me that these people are pre-modernist and modernist writers who are searching for a form which will take them back to the immediacy with which the great dramatists, the three great ancient Greek dramatists and Shakespeare, were able to present the minds of their characters. I think that all of these writers, Dostoevsky, James, and Hemingway, were seeking to overcome the limits of the prose novel form, which was the standard form of their day. Much has been made of the change which Hemingway made to the novel form, which consisted mainly of increasing the dialogue and cutting down on the description. But these writers were all in the same situation, as far as I'm concerned. They all felt the restrictions of the third-person prose novel with a guiding narrator, but they couldn't see the advantages of a first-person interior novel with no narrator at all. So they fluctuated between the two without feeling completely comfortable in either form. Whether they were conscious of the points that I'm making, whether it was a subconscious inner turmoil is something I never thought of when I was reading their biographies in great detail in earlier years, something that I would look for now if I were to read their biographies again. So topics I never thought of when I was a teacher of literature but not a writer, and early on when I was a writer of literature, I didn't think of these topics now. It's one of the most important things for me to, to explore, to learn about. I'll stop there. The rest of the essay can be found on my website at johnpassville.ca. Now, here's a note that I wrote as I was looking over this essay. I suppose one of the most intriguing questions I could ask myself about Ernest Hemingway is whether there were two Ernest Hemingways inside of one man. I've always been fascinated by the short stories and novels of Hemingway, and I've read most of them many, many times. I mentioned before in other writings that when I had read the Hemingway novels almost ragged, I started to read random chapters from the various novels interlayered without any reference to their chronology, either in the novel from which each chapter was taken or in Hemingway's career. I wanted to absorb the Hemingway ambience of character, event, and setting, even though I had read each particular chapter many times. So how to make Hemingway fresh? Well, don't read it the way it's printed in the book. Read a chapter from a later novel, and then a chapter from an earlier novel, and so on. Read a long chapter, read a short chapter. So what do I, So who then do I seem to feel are the two Hemingways? Okay, here's number one. Two Hemingways, number one. Well, I feel that the Hemingway who appeals to me is the Hemingway who can make almost everything that is every day appear to be significant. I am a writer and I sit in cafes and restaurants and scribble notes or proofread passages that are printed from my computer and I'm sure that a good part of the enjoyment that I arrive from doing so is that I can almost see myself as a character in a Hemingway novel. And yet, it's such an everyday thing to just sit in a, a, a restaurant or a cafe. There were many writers in Paris in the 1920s. I don't suppose that sitting in a cafe and polishing a short story was all that glamorous to them. They were they able to make such a simple thing as sitting in a cafe seem significant to the rest of us. But Hemingway managed to do so by whatever the Hemingway magic happens to be. So there was a magic to Hemingway and just living an everyday life. Okay. Um, but who then is the other Hemingway, the one who doesn't appeal to me? Well... I find that the other Hemingway is the one who could never stay in one place for very long. The significance of the everyday place event seemed to wear off for him after a while. So number one, he moved from Michigan to Italy to Paris to Spain to Africa to the Caribbean, each time making the ambience of the everyday experience seem significant in his writings. However, number two, somehow the everyday miraculous significance of the experience wasn't enough for him. Somehow he needed wars and bullfights and big game hunting and deep sea fishing to make life seem life worthwhile. Well, that's about all I can say. The one Hemingway appeals to me and has been a lifelong interest and enjoyment. The other Hemingway doesn't interest me at all. There's no glamour to me in killing the biggest specimen of any species while risking one's life and then calling it sport. I suppose this illustrates my point that what a writer presents to the reader whether consciously or subconsciously, has always been irrelevant to me. I've always emphasized what I, simply one reader, have gained from every author and every book that I've ever read, 
Whatever other people gain means nothing to me. I expect if my books come to be read by many people, the same will be true for those readers too. So one won't matter what John Passfield meant to the book to mean. It will matter what the reader thinks the book to mean. Once again, this is my book. I'll just hold it up again. The Poetic Novel to uh, Influences and Elements by John Passfield. Um, it's found on my website at johnpassfield.ca. So I've only read part of the Hemingway essay, the second Hemingway essay. The rest can be found there. You just go to the cover icon of the book, click on that, and there's 15 essays. Search out the Hemingway essay and read it for free. So lastly, I'll just say thank you for watching this video.